Uh, well, hi. Well, as you may already be sensing, uh, this is one of the most exciting Sundays in our history as a church. Uh, I personally have been waiting a very long time uh, to share with you what we are sharing with you today. Uh, and the headlines, as you'll have picked up, is that this wonderful Christian ministry, CWR, uh, and 24-7 prayer, the family of which we're a part, have come together to create this new entity called Waverley Abbey Trust with an astounding vision to renew and restore the Abbey for such a time as this. And it is a massively exciting uh, development for us as a church uh, for at least two reasons. The first is that Emmaus Road is one of the key resource communities at the heart of the 24-7 worldwide movement. And the second is that this is on our patch. Uh, this is on our doorstep. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that people are getting in touch with me all around the world saying, I just want to get to Waverley. I've heard about what's happening. How far from the airport is it? And the risk is that for us, you know, it's, it, it's 10 minutes down the road and we, so we don't bother. But this is the most extraordinary thing that is happening here and now. A center of prayer, uh, a center of training, as you've heard, and of hospitality uh, for this region and for the nations. And I'm really aware as we talk about this now uh, that for some of you this is very old news. Uh, because you've already seen it on social media, uh, or you were at the 24-7 conference in Belfast a couple of weeks ago, or you're already personally very involved uh, in all that's happening at Waverley. Uh, we have more than 100 members of this church who are uh, part of the seed prayer community down there at Waverley, uh, alongside our very own Jill Weber. Um, I know that uh, many of you attend the monthly worship nights we do on a Friday night at Waverley. Others have worked valiantly in, uh, in the work parties that we, we've been running down there. Tom Brewer chopping down trees and people pulling up weeds and planting things. And I know others of you have given money, uh, some extraordinarily generously towards this vision. And uh, some members of this church even serve on the board of the new entity, Fergal, uh, Chris Kachani, and so on. And uh, so for some, this is very old news. But for others, this is brand new and probably a little bit, mind, some are mind blown and some are like, this has got nothing to do with me, mate. Well, just give me a chance. So uh, just in case you haven't seen it yet, take a look at the screens and watch this video. Welcome to the Waverly Abbey Estate. <laughs> We're really excited about being here. Right behind me, you see the ruins of Waverly Abbey. This was a Cistercian monastery that was established in 1128. 12 Cistercian monks came from France across to begin a house of prayer here on site. They began to pray night and day, but that wasn't the first prayer that happened here. In 688, this land was given by King Cadwalla for a monasterium, a place of prayer. So there's been prayer here on the Waverly Abbey Estate for over a thousand years. So we're establishing here a house of prayer for the nations, helping people pray, helping churches pray more, helping churches pray together. We wanna to see all kinds of on-site prayer here, but also streaming prayer online several times a day so that we can continue to be a resource globally for people who wanna learn how to pray. Founders Day is going to become an annual celebration of three big things. The first thing is this. It was 300 years ago this year, 1722, that Herrnhut was founded. They chopped down a tree, they read Psalm 84, and they used the tree in order to start building Herrnhut. And the rest is history. That's the beginning of the modern missions and prayer movements out of Herrnhut. So that's really worth remembering. The second uh, thing that we're celebrating on Founders Day is the founding of 24-7 Prayer. Uh, it was on this day, 5th of September, 1999, that we set apart a, a 
warehouse in Chichester and started to pray night and day. No idea that here we would be 23 years later, happy birthday to us, still praying in more than half the nation's honor. And then the third thing is that today is really the founding of a whole new vision for Waverley Abbey to try and do what all the old monasteries did. And we frame that around four E's. Firstly, this is a place of encounter with God. This is going to be a place of prayer, Ignatian exercises, pilgrims coming from around the world. Our world's never needed prayer more than it does right now. The second E after encounter is education. This is going to be a new Christian university. Already this place trains more Christian counselors than anywhere else in Europe. We want to stream that all around the world and we want to add other courses. Thirdly, this is going to be a place of enterprise. There are going to be businesses here that are going to innovate and are going to generate revenue under the Waverley Abbey brand. And finally, this is going to be a place of engagement. This will be a context that fights injustice and cares for the poor and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's the vision, encounter, education, enterprise and engagement. And we believe that a, a context like this can truly serve the movement, but also change the world. Two organisations with a, with a common vision and a common mission, CWR 24-7 Prayer, sharing the site just makes perfect sense. You know, being, being an ancient monastic site, um, you know, restoring the monastic to the, uh, the organisation um, and, and working together collaboratively in one place is, is an amazing opportunity to discover new things that we can do for the kingdom. 24-7 prayer, you know, they, they bring vision and passion and prayer. Uh, you know, we already are offering great Christian training um, every day with Jesus. And I just think there's incredible synergy. And I think their vision for the site is compelling and it's a pleasure to be able to work with them. We see it as being a home of sorts for the 24-7 movement, hosting people who come on pilgrimage, wanting to learn how to pray, but also praying with this online prayer furnace for, for various of our mission bases and outposts all over the world. The OMS is Order of the Mustard Seed. We are a missional order that's embedded in the life of the 24-7 movement. We've got members, 400 members, all over the world. And so Waverly Abbey Estate is going to become a mother house for the movement. Already they've been here on retreat together. A whole bunch of us celebrated a retreat this summer together. People will come on pilgrimage. And this will be a place where ongoing spiritual formation of members will happen. This is a new abbey for a new generation where we are going to be on the cutting edge of culture, praying like crazy, serving the lost, fighting injustice, creating new products and changing the world together in an atmosphere of prayer. So there's a lot to celebrate. It really is uh, quite remarkable, isn't it? And uh, we at Emmaus get to be right at the heart of this thing that is beginning. So I'm just going to take a few minutes now to explain a little bit more about it uh, and to explain how every single one of uh, you here, those watching online, can get involved. And then we're going to do something we don't often do at church. We're going to just have questions, answers, and allegations. So uh, any of you uh, who want to join in, be preparing your questions now. But first, if you're able to do so, why don't we stand as a sign of respect for the reading of God's Word, the Bible. It's quick. So you're going to have to concentrate. One verse, Jeremiah 6, verse 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do be seated. The prophet Jeremiah is sometimes called the weeping prophet because he was pretty miserable. Uh, but he, had, he was miserable for good reason, because he was living at a time of vast cultural chaos. In fact, during his uh, ministry, the unthinkable happened, and uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. And then the even worse happened, and in 587 BC, Solomon's temple was destroyed. This is the very heart, the focal point of Israel, and it's been taken from them. And so the people of Israel are living at a time of tumult and are all thinking, how on earth do we live? What does it mean to be a, a servant of Yahweh at a time like this? And I, uh, Jeremiah stands in the middle of it. He says, at a moment of crossroads like this in our culture, you need to ask, what is the ancient path? What is the way of righteousness that you may walk in it? What if for them then and for us now at, let's be honest, uh, cultural crossroads, what if the keys to our future are actually very old? What if the new thing that we are looking for is as old as the hills? What if the greatest enemy of human progress is our own propensity for forgetfulness? And so at a time where there is this sense of what is it in the past that we might have lost, it is extraordinary that God has opened this door for us into one of the oldest places of Christian prayer in the whole country. I'm not exaggerating. You'll have picked it up from the video there. It was in the year 688 AD that a Saxon king called Cadwalla devoted that actual tract of land and set it apart as a place of prayer, a monasterium. Uh, the first mention, before Farnham is ever mentioned in any written account, it's Waverley Abbey, which is why the borough is called Waverley. Every bin says Waverley on it, but the only actual thing that called Waverley is the Abbey. And then uh, they prayed for centuries there, but of course they built out a wood so you can't see what's left of all of that physically. And then it was on November the 4th, in the year 1128, that those Cistercians turned up and they started to pray. And they built out of stone, which is why you can now see the ruins of their prayer life there, as it were. They prayed for 458 years. That's a lot of lifetimes. Poured into that ground, working the land, caring for the sick, educating and praying, praying, praying on that actual site. And it was uh, Henry VIII who abolished the monasteries that, that shut them down after that almost half a millennium of prayer just under the Cistercians and uh, even more uh, if we include uh, the Saxons and so on. And uh, everyone always thinks that the reason that Waverley Abbey is in ruins is because it's very old. That's not true. Uh, lots of really old buildings are still standing. They were very good at building. It's because sneaky old Henry not only curried favors with those powerful people he wanted to uh, give land to, but he sold the rights to local stonemasons. And so if you uh, live in Elstead or in that little neck of the woods and you're in an old house, chances are uh, you've got stones nicked from Waverley Abbey in your house. So speaking of which... Uh, it was in the year 1723 uh, that a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir John Aislable, uh, he, um, we assume, nicked a lot of rock from uh, the ruins as well, uh, thereby helping them to become ruins, and built that filthy, great, uh, very beautiful Georgian uh, grade two listed house 
uh, that's just on the other side there. I don't know quite what this means prophetically, but as far as we know, that was the last time a chance of the Exchequer was in that neck of the woods, and now the MP for Waverley is quite surprisingly, and no one expects saw this coming, uh, Jeremy Hunt is Chancellor of the Exchequer all over the papers again today, and is very supportive, by the way, of all that we're seeking to do. And uh, then it was uh, all the great and the good, the grand fromage, the big cheeses uh, of the day would all come and hang out at, um, at, at, at Waverley. If you're cultured, you can think of Trollope uh, and Barchester Chronicles. If you're uncultured, you can think of Bridgerton at this moment, um, but almost certainly with less sex, actually. Sorry to disappoint. And... Uh, and so you have Florence Nightingale and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sir Walter Scott. What a night that was, no. Uh, but all these people would be hanging out uh, there. And then uh, it, lots of things happened with that house uh, and eventually it fell into disrepair. And in 1983, a remarkable Welshman, son of a miner, uh, Selwyn Hughes, uh, founder of this ministry, CWR, bought this semi-derelict building. I don't think that it had a proper roof on it at the time. And for almost 40 years uh, has, has used it to the glory of God. Um, a lot of praying, uh, writing every day with Jesus, that one of the forerunners of a daily devotional has gone all over the world, a million users, printed and used in prisons, amazing resource. Uh, and also began training uh, Christian counselors, seeking to use the best of psychology and the best of theology together. And it, it really is phenomenal training. Uh, my own dear wife, Sammy, is alumni. She trained there. I know others of you here uh, have, have graduated uh, from there. And it is just amazing. And she's extremely busy uh, as a counselor now. Uh, sorry to disappoint if any of you, uh, I think she's got a waiting list. I don't know. Anyway. Um, I digress. So amazing story. You talk about the ancient paths on, uh, of prayer on this site. And then it was about 13 years ago that uh, the Lord spoke to me. Um, and I've got it all recorded in my journal. I've gone back and looked it up. And he said this to me. He said, Pete, the movement, he was referring to 24-7, the movement needs a mother house. We're very decentralized uh, we're all over the world, we're over 100 nations doing all this stuff. We've done it all the wrong way. You're supposed to ha you know, have a big hub, a big center, and then try and ship stuff out. We've just shipped stuff out without any real hub or center. And, uh, you know, we're more starfish than spider, if you ever read that book. And that's been great. But So it was quite a moment the Lord said, but you are going to need a mother house. And um, that was the beginning of, uh, of sensing that at some point we, we'd need to establish that. And I just assumed we'd have to go somewhere where land was a lot cheaper. Uh, maybe we'd take over an old boarding school or an old monastery or something. And if I can be honest with you, uh, it felt like a guilty secret. Because as, as around that time, Sammy and I had only just recently taken on leadership in Emmaus Road. And we... We just fall in love with this church and with this part of the world, with this community. And there was this sense of, oh, rats, God's got another assignment for us. And we're not going to be able to be here, you know, forever. Um, you know, there's somewhere else. We're going to have to go somewhere else to do this mother house thing. And so it was the most extraordinary moment when a wonderful member of this church, Mick Brooks, who's the former leader of CWR, uh, Mick and Lynette Brooks, much loved, uh, you know, parents of jazz, Mike and jazz, you'll know, and, and so on. And, and Mick uh, phoned me, said, Pete, will you come down to uh, Waverley? I want to talk to you. And so I drove down, and he, he, he basically said to me, Pete, look, we're every day with Jesus. We use the Bible to help people connect with God. Your 24-7 prayer, you help people connect with God through prayer. It's two sides of the same coin. We're pretty much in the same postcode. We've got 112 acres here. There's at least 50 acres of woodland. We don't know what to do with it. Do you, do you want it? I think literally when I asked, do you want it? And I went, all right. And, <laughs> and uh, um, that was the beginning of a very long process, as you can see, of talking and praying and trying to work out what's the right thing to do, what's the right way to do it, and so on. 
And, uh, uh, you know, at around that time, I remember taking Bill Cusack down to Waverley on this sort of top secret hush hush trip. And, uh, uh, you know, Bill obviously led this congregation for years. He's probably here somewhere. Um, and uh, but, you know, Bill hears God in the most amazing ways. And we're wandering around the ruins. I said, Bill, what do you reckon? Is this mad? And he, he got all serious. And he said, Pete, I can hear the prayers coming out of the ground. And I said, what do you mean like you're doing that prophetic thing? You're saying you can imagine them. You're getting all a bit like romanticized about it all. He said, no, I feel like if I switched on my iPhone, I could record the voices I am hearing coming out of the ground in this place. And I'm a bit thick and don't really hear things like that or always see things like that. But I trust Bill. And there's something extraordinary. The Celts, we call it a thin place, about somewhere people have poured their whole lives. The scriptures talk about a cloud of witness. Do you think they're not still interceding, still longing for the prayers they buried in the ground there to multiply and come to life? And then around uh, that time, during that process, I did a sneaky thing. I, I, uh, I knew Jill Weber. She was leading this brilliant house of prayer in Ontario, Canada. And I knew she's like the best person I know in the world who could lead a praying community. And I, I, I took it at Waverly. I gave it my best shot, said, how about quitting everything that you're doing and coming and, and helping us head this up? And, and she, did, she was very rude, in all honesty. Um, <laughs> she said no uh, to me. And then what makes it much worse, she went away and prayed about it. And then God said it to her, and she said, yes. So I don't like that she saw the difference. And I don't know why she would say no to me, and yes, no, I do. But And so the real top secret reason she moved here, uh, much she loves this church, and you know she heads up spiritual formation for us, is, was this vision of, of this thing. So this has been a long, long process. And then... Um, Something historic happened on the 28th of June this year. And I know we all hear stories all the time about Christians dividing and disagreeing and competing and all that horrible stuff, which is the opposite of what Jesus prayed for in his family. But something beautiful happened. The 28th of June, the um, uh, trustees of CWR met uh, and they all tendered their resignations and said, um, we want you guys, Pete, will you come and bring spiritual leadership? Uh, my friend Ken Costa, would you come and be the chair? Chris Kachani, member of this church, also 24-7 trustee, will you join the board? Will you rebuild this board uh, so that these two organizations come together? And at that point, we'd, we'd been doing a lot of fundraising and we'd, we'd raised... Uh, a bit of money, uh, a significant bit of money, uh, and some people have been very generous, and and they said, Look, if you will just give us that, which is probably less than you know less than quarter what the site's worth, then it's sort of let's do it's yours and let's do this together, and so uh, it was a beautiful moment of two ministries saying, let's work together. Let's bring your gifts and our gifts and love one another and do something for the glory of God. So I want you to hear that in your heart because let's be honest, we've all heard enough of the stories of people not being like that. And I want to honor uh, CWR and Mark Markovich and, and all of those guys for that. I think uh, out of these four E's that you've seen on the screen there, um, you know, enterprise and engagement and uh, education, the heart of it all is the encounter with God peace. Because there is such a sense of urgency as we stand at these cultural crossroads of the call to prayer. That is the thing that would have resonated most profoundly with those who spent centuries praying on that land. Yes, they educated. Yes, they cared for the sick. Yes, they worked the land. But the heart of it all was their rhythm of prayer. And uh, we sense God calling us back to those ancient paths at this time. The theologian Thomas Torrance says, the prayers of the saints... And the fire of God moves the whole course of the world. They are the most potent, 
the most disturbing, the most revolutionary, the most terrifying powers that the world knows. And, and I think we sense that. It's a calling upon us as Christians and as this church in particular. It was so wonderful uh, after COVID and then the three floods we had in our prayer room to reopen our prayer room recently, just across the road there. And Simon uh, Pyburn uh, sent me the most beautiful uh, email and gave me permission to share it with you. He said, when I first arrived in the prayer room, I was blown away for quite a while. It was such a beautiful place to be. And then when I noticed that at the end of my 2 to 3 a.m. slot, there appeared to be three blank hours. Anyone familiar with this? On the timetable. I decided that I would at least, I like this, occupy the room for four hours. So I took a blanket and an eye mask, uh, thinking that I would do a young Samuel and sleep in the temple if I ran out of steam. He says, I didn't need them. The time flew by. This must be placed, he says, in the context of my complete inability to spend time with God before. I'd only encountered dry church prayer meetings, which were, in the main part, hard work. It's wonderful, isn't it, actually? It's it's beautiful. Our world has never needed a praying people more. The politicians, boy, they need to do their bit. But we know it's not going to get the job done. We need the economists to do their bit. We need everyone to do their bit. But it's only the people of God that know how to lay hold of the goodness of God and the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God, the ways of God, the ancient ways of God, and remind the culture where it came from. And uh, I, I want to draw this together by saying this. I believe the next two years of our lives together, of your life, could well be the greatest of our lives. The next two years could be the greatest of our lives. There are astounding opportunities presenting themselves to us in this moment. The material need is just shocking. It is desperate all around. I talked to someone last night who's uh, just had a, a, a stroke and uh, he's um, under enormous stress, and his 16-year-old daughter is just uh, about to give birth. He's trying to process becoming a granddad very, very young and very unexpectedly, and he's just in a a bad way, Uh, excited about the baby, but a bad way. And uh, he said, the worst is I'm just so worried about money. He's a carpenter. I'm so worried about money. I don't know how I'm going to cope. There's hundreds and thousands of these stories, of course, all around us. It's great seeing uh, the absolute heroes uh, here, Eric and Bex and the whole team at at, at Lighthouse, the way they serve uh, some of uh, the most beautiful and needy people is just stunning. And, of course, we're celebrating with them uh, royal patronage. We are going to be patronized by royalty henceforth. Uh, Very good at it. Um, uh, But, yes, the Countess of Wessex uh, is now now the patron of Lighthouse. But, uh, you know, um, these guys are saying that you demand that the food bank's gone up fourfold, the Ukrainian hub busier than ever. And, and then, of course, it's not just material hunger, it's spiritual hunger in the nation. Sammy and I had the privilege of spending quite a bit of time with Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, on Monday. And, and he was talking about that great preach he did at the, uh, the funeral, the Queen's funeral. And they now reckon that it was around 4 billion people that watched it, which means half the world's population. It is the biggest televised event in world history and it was a Christian service at which the scriptures were read Jesus Christ was worshipped and I think he did a pretty good job sharing the gospel and so and so I know you hear a lot of good news but there is a spiritual opportunity in this moment there is an openness in our culture which we must not miss And from that extreme to the other, this time last week, 
four members of this church had just become Christian. Well, they became members of this church. They became Christians on Alpha, on the Holy Spirit Day. You see, the kingdom of God is advancing. As I get to speak today at uh, three of our congregations, I can tell you they are all pretty much full. And I've just come from Aldershot, and God is blessing us. And it, I don't know what we do. I think we're probably going to have to start another service here at some point. It'll be Adam and Hannah's decision. But uh, the Lord is with us and is blessing us. We just had, I think, about 80 people go through our welcome course to join the, the church. And I want to say this really clearly to you. I know it's difficult I know the next two years are going to be some of the hardest of our lives. I know the pressure's upon us financially and in every other way. I understand it is going to be difficult. I'm not pretending otherwise, but I'm also telling you the next two years could be the greatest of our lives. Because as the old saying, amen, as the old saying goes, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what the ship is built for. You were built for times like this because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. It's what you're made for, to care for the poor. Guess what? There's more of them. To feed the hungry. Guess what? There's more hunger. To preach the gospel. Guess what? More people are asking questions to which Jesus Christ is the answer than ever before. Get on your motorbike. Saddle up. You were built for the next two years. Don't miss it. Don't circle the wagons. Don't lick your wounds too long because there is a world that is waiting for the people of God to arise and preach the gospel and bind up broken hearts and announce the year of the Lord's favor at the unlikeliest time who know how to stand at the crossroads in a moment of cultural chaos and say, remember the ancient ways. Amen? Amen. It's a time to pray. Fifteen hundred years ago, dear old Benedict, in his rule, said this, Let us arise then at last, for the Scriptures stir us, saying, Now is the hour for us to rise from sleep. And then bang slap in the middle of this moment at the worst possible time and the best possible time, God goes and does this wavely thing that we've been talking about and praying about for 13 years as a place of prayer for this region and for the nations led by our own Jill Weber as a new God willing Christian university led by I can now say this our very own Bev and Jason there as a center for social enterprise you know the bridge right out the door there over the river was built you see the plaque by the monks from Waverley Abbey as a launch pad for missional engagement. And so we can all be involved. I want you to consider how you might get involved. Fit in the postcard that you should have somewhere near you on the seat. It's always tricky with flipping chairs, but fill this in. Listen, I know you spend your whole life trying not to get spammed. You want to be spammed by Waverly Abbey, okay? But just we don't even quite know what you're signing up for, nor do you. But just if you're like, ah, uh, yeah, I think I want to journey with this. I I feel like I'm in at the start. We will keep you posted as all of this stuff grows and unfolds. And we also obviously don't want to hassle people who aren't interested. You might want to do the True North course that Jill Webb is leading, which is really about exploring some of the spirituality that you'll be sensing and picking up uh, here. Consider coming and, and, and training Waverley Abbey College like Sammy did and, and uh, you know, get yourself tooled up uh, in your workplace. Uh, you get trained as a chaplain. In also, we, we can now ordain people into that. Uh, you might want to join the praying community down there. There's enough of you that already have. You might want to come to the monthly worship nights. You might want to hire out the shepherd's hut as a quiet, peaceful place in a very special place to go and pray uh, down there. But as I finish, I believe the Lord is speaking to us through the prophet Jeremiah saying to us, yes, you find yourself at a cultural crossroads. And it is a moment in your life. It's a moment in the life of this nation 
when if we will return to the ancient paths, if we will remember to walk in the ways of righteousness, we will find rest for our souls. Who thinks that sounds pretty good? Rest for our souls. Amen. Amen.